Australians are entitled and expect the highest quality healthcare in the world, and generally they get it. Compared to US, Canada, Western Europe, UK, we're right up there in terms of quality, in terms of reasonable access, in terms of affordability. Australia has a global reputation as a healthy nation. Our life expectancy is one of the highest in the world. We have good cancer survival outcomes. Our cervical cancer screening and vaccination program is probably the best in the world. I think we look great globally. I think we need to do much better with certain groups in our population. But is our health system stuck in the past? Our health system is designed to cure and that means something needs to go wrong first. <coughs> General practice is really integral to the health of Australians. Not only are we the first port of call where we're basically keeping people healthy, living longer lives and keeping them out of those hospitals. Every week, more than two million Australians visit GPs like Melbourne's Lara Roeski, and for most, it's their entry point into the healthcare system. Emilio. Hello. Hi. Hi. Come through. Thanks. Just this way. Thank you. Is it fair to say that your role is much broader than just purely a medical specialist? My role also extends to problem solving, advocating for patients, and looking after people from birth to death. What's brought you in today? In the past, GPs focused on acute needs such as measles and polio, but today they face very different challenges. So if you come along with me now, we'll take your blood pressure. Some of the standouts, particularly now, are um, mental health. And the other big area for us at the moment is managing um, the complex needs of um, chronic disease. They include conditions like um, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia. Managing chronic disease among working age people is incredibly important. 7.30 can reveal that the latest official health figures show that 11.4 million Australians have a chronic disease. That's a staggering one in two people. That's up from two and five just ten years ago. About a third of chronic disease can be preventable. Yet we only spend 1.3% of our health budget on preventing disease. Health policy expert Ben Harris says a standard GP appointment of less than 20 minutes is simply too short to address these latest complex needs. Working with somebody with chronic health needs can often take a lot of time. If somebody is overweight, has diabetes, the beginnings of anxiety or depression, that is not a 10 minute conversation with a doctor. In this year's budget, the federal government announced it plans to fund longer consultations for people over 70. But chronic illnesses are now being diagnosed not just more often, but in younger and younger Australians. <whistles> Molly Lucas was eight when she was diagnosed with type one diabetes. If she doesn't have insulin, she dies, basically. That's what it is. So monitoring her blood sugar 24 hours a day. As you're growing, your insulin requirements are gonna change. Molly works with a team of specialists and needs to see her GP, Dr. Marek Steiner, at least every five weeks. I would estimate that probably about 75% of my workload are patients that require more complex needs. The current system doesn't really allow us to focus on uh, ongoing proper care for a patient over time. And then how we counteract it those few hours later. That's right, so you don't get a hypo after that. Yes. Okay. Some of the things we'd like to do, um, we basically hit that barrier that the patient can't afford that. The latest figures show around two in every three people who visit a GP are bulk billed, meaning they pay nothing. For everyone else, the fee for a standard appointment is about $80. The Medicare rebate is just $37.60. I think one of the big challenges is the sustainability of our system. Um, the costs of healthcare grow greater than the, than the growth in GDP every year. 
and that does lead us to sort of think about how we can make it more sustainable and one of the impacts of that has been the recent increase in out-of-pocket costs charged by some uh, doctors and others and that's put a pressure on some of our community. Practitioners have been saying for years that the current funding model called fee-for-service needs an overhaul. A hospital package will cover Molly's basic needs until she's 18, but the family still has to pay for other services, such as a podiatrist, gastroenterologist and optometrist separately, instead of receiving a package of funding to cover all the needs of her condition. Australia has had 16 major reviews of our health system over the last 35 years, and they've all said the same thing. Fee-for-service medicine is no longer serving Australia as it should. Our health system needs to be able to answer. Veteran advisor Terry Barnes worked with the Howard government on health policy. Well, I think both sides of politics understand the need for significant change, but that's not how you get elected. He says there is a growing push for change. There's a school of thought, particularly with the burden of disease and, and the rise of chronic illness uh, affecting so many patients, uh, to take a more holistic approach, so effectively give the GP a budget and they, they, um, they provide or contract or buy in services for you uh, in a case managed sort of way. Um, that's, that's good, but again, it's very hard to actually turn, turn the Queen Mary. What is clear is that as far as your health is concerned, where you live really matters. Across Australia, we know that wealthy communities do a lot better. The Mitchell Institute at Victoria University has been looking at the difference in health outcomes between suburbs in the same city. We know that people of lower socioeconomic means are more likely to have health risk factors, much more likely to have disease and a lot more likely to die early from chronic disease. And the evidence is in the data. Analysis by the Institute reveals the obesity rate in Brisbane's upmarket suburbs of Indooroopilly and Turinga is 16%, but in New Chum and Red Bank Plains, it's 40.4%. In Sydney, 6.6% of people in Gordon smoke, whereas in Mount Druitt, it's 31%. We know that wealthy communities do a lot better. What we have in Australia is a universal health system, but it's not necessarily a fair health system. 47.6% of residents in Perth's waterfront Cottesloe area don't do enough exercise. In Seville Grove, that percentage jumps to 70. The rate of diabetes in Canberra's affluent inner city suburbs is 1.8 for every 100,000 people. In the Cotter and Namadji region outside the city, it's 10.6. Overall, in the last four years, an extra 49,000 people have died from lower socioeconomic communities than from the highest. The best thing you can do for your health is be wealthy. Terry Barnes believes it's crucial that Medicare is changed to make it efficient and effective for this century. If there are no significant reforms, if basically we keep tinkering around the edges, and if anybody does have bold ideas, they're shouted down. We're going to be in quite a bit of trouble down the track. I don't think anybody on either side of politics wants to be remembered as being responsible for that. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.